Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to Jerusalem Presbyterian Church on this seventh Sunday of Easter. The Pentecost offering is our subject this morning. It unites us in a church-wide effort to support young people and inspire them to share their faith, ideas, and unique gifts with the church and the world. Pentecost will be specifically celebrated next Sunday, May 23rd. I've been chosen for this responsibility of telling this story today primarily because of this bright red jacket. We're asked to wear red to help celebrate Pentecost, so I have dusted it off as expected to wear again this year. Psalm 71 tells us that a foundation of faith established during childhood helps ensure lifelong faith and service. By giving to the Pentecost offering, you participate in helping our youth to proclaim with the palmist, thank God from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. Almost half of your gift to the Pentecost offering will be used for our youth-oriented doings right here at JPC. The rest will support children at risk, youth, and young adults through the ministries of the Churchwide Presbyterian Mission Agency. These include the young adult volunteers, the guiding youth ministries, and the senior project. All this and many other activities provide a way for us here in Wales to be involved in mission ministry far and wide. You may bring your donation next Sunday on Pentecost or do so electronically using the JPC web website with the foundation option. Additionally, you may want to keep in mind that Bruce and Maria Tammy are again challenging us with a matching pledge of $1,500 specifically for the Pentecost offering. Thank you for your support. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Great Lord, you have called us by name and sent us out to be your people, to be your hands in this world, to do your work. We ask that you send your spirit as we worship you this day, that we may know your will and may know your love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's begin this service by singing our opening hymn. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared in the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Because we were buried with Christ in these waters, we are also raised to life with them. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. 
The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please pass the peace of Christ to your neighbor in word or in spirit. First reading today is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So earlier in this week, we had a Christian holiday. What's that, you ask? Well, we actually had Ascension of the Lord, which is actually last Thursday. Ascension of the Lord is the 40th day after Easter. So it's always the Thursday between the 6th and the 7th Sunday of Easter. So this year it was May 13th. Today we are taking the scriptures from that day in the lectionary, Ascension of the Lord, not from the 7th Sunday of Easter. Listen for God's word as I read Luke 24, 44 through 53. Then the risen Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there are two stories of the Ascension, and we've just read both of them. The one that Dennis read is from Acts of the Apostles. The one that I read is from the end of the Gospel of Luke. That's literally how Luke ends. And there's one major difference between the two stories, though I'm not sure it's explicitly stated. In the story I just read, the, the resurrection in Luke happens that day, the same day as the Ascension. So it's later in the day on Easter is when the ascension happens in Luke. But in Acts of the Apostles, it's traditionally held that the ascension happens on the 40th day after Easter. Why do we have the difference? Especially because we recognize that Luke and Acts were written by the same person. They literally changed the story from one book to the next. 
So why the difference? And it's like one of those things where when they begin the sequel, they show you the final scene of the original movie. So we get two different takes on this one story. The story of the ascension is both an ending, it's the culmination of Luke, and it's a beginning, it's the beginning of Acts. In case anyone has ever wondered, why does the story of Pentecost not start on Acts 1, but Acts 2? Because Acts 1 is the ascension. To put it another way, ascension is a holiday. And a moment that kind of floats between the two major celebrations, or two of the major celebrations in the Christian calendar. It's, it's not like Epiphany, in the sense that, that it's always the same day of the year. Epiphany is always the 6th of January. But it's something like Epiphany, it's tied to another holiday, where Epiphany is, you know, 13 days after Christmas. This is 40 days after Easter, or 10 days before Pentecost. But there's this tugging, this pulling from both Easter and Pentecost, that the ascension kind of is in between. In Luke, the ascension leans more towards Easter. It happens on Easter day, after all. And in Acts, the ascension kind of leans towards Pentecost, what are 10 days after it, which is why we're, we're talking about it today, because Ascension was just a couple days ago. And the tugging between Ascension being closer to Easter, closer to Pentecost, it fits with how the scripture works, or how the story works in scripture. Luke and Acts, after all, are prequel and sequel, and, and the second story begins with the retelling of the first. But let's change gears and ask a very simple question. It's a question that I ask in our Bible study all the time when we're looking at a particular story. And it's the question, what question is this story trying to answer? Like, like Genesis 1, the story of creation, what's it answering? How the world began. So if we ask, what question is the ascension trying to answer? Or a more direct version of this question is, why is this story in Scripture? This has the easiest answer of that question. Why is the ascension in scripture? Because where's Jesus if there's not an ascension? Right? We believe that Jesus rose on Easter and came back to the world, but we live in a world with no Jesus in the flesh. That's the answer. That's the question that the ascension is answering. So what do we do with this? The risen Jesus is not here, but is with us. The risen Jesus has the power to overcome in death, and yet death still occurs, so what now? I'm sure what now is something that probably went through the disciples' heads that day. Because they had lived through this experience. They had seen their friend and their teacher killed, and then come back to life, and then left again. What now? Jesus had promised the sending of the Spirit, but that wouldn't be delivered until 10 days later. So what now? One way to answer that question is to say that because of the ascension, discipleship, being a Christian, is a matter of faith, of believing what is not seen. How easy would it be to be a disciple? if the risen Jesus was in this world, if Jesus was here in the flesh. So the ascension is about faith. That is the answer that I think is also connected to ascension being connected to Easter, because Easter and ascension are both things, stories that we take on faith. They're on the importance of faith, of believing what we cannot see. But here's the catch for today. The lessons that we learn about the ascension cannot only be about faith. It's easy to end there, but they shouldn't end there. 
Christianity itself cannot only be about faith, but about how that faith is lived out. The other really important understanding from this story of the Ascension is the one that points us towards Pentecost. Jesus is not on earth, and that means he has entrusted us with continuing the work that he did. Being a disciple is not just about faith, but it's about doing the work. Putting in the work to make our world better. I'll tell you, I'm so glad from conversations this week that that we are ramping up to get ready for the art fair. Because you know what? Our world is better with the art fair in it. We learned that last year. Our world is better when we can help fund many not-for-profits doing great things in our community and in our county. The art fair, too often this is a cliche, but the art fair is doing the Lord's work. Earlier this week, the the multi-church garden committee had its first meeting over Zoom, and Dawn Carr and Marge Bartz are our two representatives representing JPC on it. And Dawn told me they had a good meeting, and she said it seems really well organized so far but they're up against the challenge of, of getting veggies in the ground this year. You know, it's, it's already May. And so they're having their next meeting soon, and it's going to be actually on site up, up at Kettle Moraine Presbyterian Church, and we'll have more details after that. But once again, growing vegetables for people to eat for nourishment, that's doing the Lord's work. So I want to tell you a story of a conversation earlier this week. I gave a call on over to Oregon. I have an aunt and uncle that live out in Corvallis, Uncle Ott and Aunt Susan. They both grew up in Chicagoland. Uncle Ott is still a huge Cubs fan. They met at Cornell College, and then they moved out to Corvallis when Uncle Ott started a doctoral program at Oregon State. Aunt Susan is my dad's oldest sibling, so I don't know what their age is, but they must be around 80. And and Uncle Ott just had a major surgery. So another aunt, my Aunt Kathleen, who is my father's youngest sibling, went out to Oregon to be with her sister. And so I thought, this is great. I can talk to two different aunts on Mother's Day. But we didn't connect. But we chatted in the middle of the week. And I called on the phone, and Aunt Susan said, just a second, just a second, Aunt Kathleen's right here too. But we're talking on my my watch, because my phone's in the shop. And so we were talking, I guess it's an Apple Watch, and, and I was literally talking to two women as one held out her wrist so they both could talk. And we talked about family, and they asked me about how Isaac was doing at the end of high school. And I told him Isaac's latest harebrained scheme. You see, Isaac, as a senior in high school, he looks like a man now, not really like a teenager. He's, he's like 6'3 now. And he has this plan to wear a suit on his final day of school because he likes to dress up sometime. But when I was chatting with him last week, he said, Uncle Andy, I have a plan. I'm going to wear a suit the final day of class, and I'm going to walk into the teacher's lounge and pour myself a cup of coffee and see how long it's going to take to get me kicked out. I told my aunts this plan, and they cackled for minutes. See, both Susan and Kathleen have been troublemakers in their day, too. And as great aunts to Isaacs, they said, this is the best idea they've ever heard, and he should totally try it. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm an uncle, I should probably be encouraging this, but I also know that I would have then the wrath of my sister to deal with after this. And then I asked them how Michael was doing. Now, now Michael is my cousin, my eldest cousin, and he actually lives in New Delhi. Uh, He married an Indian woman, and and they moved over there because she is a prolific writer in India. And they had their vaccines a while ago. He, He does some work with the American Embassy in New Delhi, and so they were eligible for the vaccine. Uh, and they're supposed to come to Oregon for about a month in the middle of the summer. 
And Anne Susan's big fear is that Michael will be able to get through because he's an American citizen, uh, but his wife only has a green card. And so will she be able to visit? All three of their kids are actually going to school in the United States. And then we hung up because even though Otto was watching the Cubs game inside, they had to make dinner. But I'll tell you, it was so great to chat with my aunts and to laugh about my nephew's harebrained brain plans and to ask them how relatives across an ocean were doing. And I think of these things as doing the Lord's work. Connecting with family, laughing, enjoying the summer. That's doing the Lord's work. Making our lives better, doing the Lord's work. Enjoying this world that God has given us, doing the Lord's work. May we live into that every day of our lives. Amen. We come to our time of sharing our joys and our concerns. One concern we lift up is for John Gardner as he is in hospice. We lift up our prayers for him and his wife Donna and for the whole Gardner family. We also lift up prayers. Uh, Dale and Carolee Heinen have some good friends that are going through many challenges, so we pray for them as well. And we lift up everybody on Marilyn's list for all those who are battling cancer. Let us pray. Great Lord, we ask that you watch over John in the coming days, that as he comes to return to you, we ask for not just the certainty, but also the promise of the resurrection to be fulfilled. We lift up Donna, we lift up the whole family, and just ask for you to comfort them at this time. We pray this day for the Heinen's friends as well during their challenges, and for all those who are battling cancer. We pray this day for your whole world. We pray for those in the Middle East that peace may reign. And we ask for peace in our country and in our hearts as well. We pray for your church, for all those who will be celebrating Pentecost next week and the return of your spirit. We ask for your spirit to, to kindle our hearts once again. We pray this day, not just what I've spoken out loud, but the prayers that are deepest within our hearts. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us conclude this service by singing our closing hymn. A few announcements as we close. First of all, yes, we are taking donations for the Art Fair book sale. You can bring them by Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday mornings. Uh, we're going to start by storing them in the, in the classroom downstairs. 
The bridge group is back up and meeting, so if you want to play cards with them, come on out on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Uh, feel free to email Marilyn to tell them, though, that you're coming. We'd, we'd always love to have more people play. Uh, other things to announce, there will be a letter going out next week, probably the end of next week, detailing some of the decisions session made in terms of returning to in-person worship inside, so look for that as well. Finally, we are looking to make sure that we celebrate all of our graduates in a couple weeks. So if somebody in your family has graduated, email me or let me know some way uh, so we can make sure that they are celebrated too. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom God calls you to love. From now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen. Second reading.